Hi there, welcome to Active Intelligence. I'm Aaron Ironside. I hope you've got half an hour to spare as we take a look at social trends from a variety of points of view. And the goal is to present some balance rather than bias. We all want to be happy, that's understandable. But what about toxic positivity and the cult of happiness? Is happiness overrated? Find out today on Active Intelligence. On today's program, I catch up with Sarah Catherall. She's a journalist and writer and wrote an excellent op-ed recently around toxic positivity and the new industry that has risen up to try and help us all obtain unending 24-7 happiness. Can we be ecstatic and happy and joyful all the time? Well, certainly there are those who are trying to make a buck or two from convincing us that it is a possibility. We'll talk to Sarah about that a little later on. But first of all, why is it that we are not happy? And does anybody know what the keys to happiness really are? In order to understand how to be happy, we need to look at how we think. There are three different ways we react to everything around us. The first is by wanting. We're brought up in a culture where we're told that we need to obtain something or reach a certain goal in order to be happy. Oh, we need to get that new phone. We need to get a bigger TV. We need to get that promotion. We need to take a picture of this meal and put it onto Instagram. But if you think back to any major purchase you made or achievement you reached or picture you posted, sure, you felt happier for a while, but soon after you were back on the hunt. Every single time you end up finding yourself back at your original original level of happiness, only this time with less money in your wallet and more wrinkles on your face. So it's safe to say, happiness doesn't lie in the wanting category. The second way we react is by rejecting. From the moment we wake up, our mind automatically starts to look for things to reject around us. Ugh, I feel so tired but I have to go to work. Ugh, it's so cold, I don't want to leave my bed. We reject others. Ugh, he's so awkward. Ugh, why can't this cashier do his job properly? We reject ourselves. Ugh, I'm so out of shape. Ugh, why am I such a loser? Again, it's safe to say there isn't much happiness here either. The third way we react is by zoning out. When we're confronted with a task that's quote unquote boring, like commuting to work or waiting at the doctor's office, we tend to zone out. Everything becomes sort of hazy. It's almost as if you put on a black and white filter over your eyes, your brain goes on to sleep mode, and your mind is either lost in the past, over past regrets, or lost in the future, filled with anxiety about things things that might go wrong. Doesn't sound like a fun place to be. These three ways of reacting make up over 99% of the way the average person goes about his day-to-day -day life. No wonder they're unhappy. So how do I become happy? Well, there's actually a fourth way of reacting, something that we only experience once in a blue moon. It's here where happiness really lies. It's the way you reacted when you visited the Grand Canyon for the first time. It's the feeling astronauts describe when they see the Earth from outer space. It's the way you were when you were younger, able to spend hours just looking at bugs and pictures. It's called mindfulness. Think of it as the opposite of zoning out. You're zoning in, being hyper aware of everything in front of you, the way something feels, the way it moves, its smell, its taste, all of its features and nothing else. This means there's no room for wanting, no room for rejecting, and you're certainly not zoned out. All of your focus is just on the exact thing or event happening right in front of you. There is no judgment. There's simply room for you to take it all in. And when you react to things and events, with mindfulness, happiness follows and it stays for good. By simply learning how to focus on what's in front of you, you make room for happiness in your life. So that's that word mindfulness that we hear so much of. And on the one hand, it does have its roots in a kind of Buddhist worldview. But keeping that spirituality aside, I think Many of us can see the point that simply being present in the moment and actually with our loved ones and focusing on them and enjoying the moment is going to lead to more happiness than if we're worried about the things we've done in the past or anticipating the things that might happen in the future. It seems, of course, that uh, nearly all spiritual worldviews have some kind of take on happiness. 
Brene Brown leans more into the Christian tradition and said that actually her 12 years of research and 11,000 pieces of data revealed that people who experienced, in her case, joy, which I'm sure is a variant of happiness, had a particular practice. That is the practice of gratitude. And when I say practice, I think this is this is the part that really changed my life. It changed my family and the way we live every day. When I say practice gratitude, I don't mean kind of like the attitude of gratitude or feeling grateful. I mean practicing gratitude. These folks shared in common a tangible gratitude practice. They either kept gratitude journals. Um, some of them did interesting things like at 1, 2, 3, 4, like at 12, 34 every day. They said something out loud that they were grateful for. They, um, one of the things that we do, like we say grace at dinner. And so now after grace, we go around and everyone in my family says something they're grateful for. I mean, and what's interesting is when we first started, I have um, a first grader, a first grade son, Charlie, and eighth grade daughter, Alan. And at first I thought, and we've been doing it for a couple of years now, like they're going to like, oh God, mom. And if there was a little like, this is, you know, are you experimenting on us? There was a little bit of that. But now what's interesting, even after we did it for like a couple of weeks, that on those crazy busy nights where we're trying to like get to soccer and piano and homework and Steve and I are just like, we say, we say a quick prayer and we start eating and my kids are like, whoa, what are you grateful for? Mm -hmm. And it's been extraordinary because not only absolutely does it invite more joy into our house, um, it also is such a soulful window into what's going on in my kids' lives. You know, so there are some days where my eighth grader will be like, I'm joyful that there's a huge thick wall between my room and my brother's room. You know, something just very, you know, honest. But there are other days she'll say, you know, she had a friend whose mother recently died. Um, and she said, you know, for a month she would say, I'm just so grateful that y'all are healthy right now. You know, and so not only did it make us all more aware of what we had and more willing to slow down and really be thankful for the joyful moments we had, but it let me know where she was emotionally in her life. You know, and my son is, is always, you know, I'm grateful for bugs, I'm grateful for frogs, but sometimes he'll say, you know, I'm grateful that you picked me up early, or, you know, I'm grateful that I finally understand adjectives, <laughs> you know? So it's, there's a great quote um, that says, it's not, grat it's not joy that makes us grateful, it's gratitude that makes us joyful. And um, it's by a Jesuit brother, a Jesuit priest. And I guess I was just amazed to find that bubble up so strongly in the research. It's life changing. American psychologist Brene Brown reminding us, of course, that there are things we can do to, to cultivate happiness. But interesting that the gratitude precedes the joy rather than follows it. It's kind of like I think that our brain will find what we tell it to look for. And when we're being grateful, we're telling it to look for reasons to be happy, that it's OK to be happy. Of course, we live in a culture that says as soon as you're not happy, but uh, problem, maybe you need medication, maybe you need to see a doctor or a counsellor. Certainly, your sad feelings are a sign that something's wrong, as if the only human state that's acceptable is happiness. Which is why I caught up with writer and journalist Sarah Catherall to explore some of the ideas that she had presented in her op-ed called Toxic Positivity. Well, I, I, I've noticed that since my mother's generation so I was born in 1970 so I think um, really in the last how many years is that probably last three decades there's been an expectation that we should be living our best lives we should be happy we should be thriving we should be successful we should be walking around with a sort of big smile on our faces and um, bursting into song kind of thing and there's this whole sort of industry that has sprung both sprung up to kind of um, facilitate that and then it's kind of had its own little um, force or culture that's come along with it and uh, yeah, so I feel that there's a big grey area between happiness and unhappiness between feeling good and feeling depressed or anxious or all those mental health conditions that we can be quite quick to diagnose as well. So I've, I've actually written quite a lot about that as well. I'm quite interested in mental health and youth as well and how, you know, today if your child says, I am a bit scared or I'm a bit anxious, parents are quick to jump. 
I've got three daughters and they're all, you know, pretty mentally well. But I know that there is um, schools are offering well-being programs. Everyone, of course, you know, we should acknowledge when people are having mental health difficulties. But it's a big, broad spectrum of uh, issues and we're all unique individuals and I think it doesn't help when we kind of um, package something as you should be this and you should be that and if you're not, you're this and that. You've mentioned kind of the generational challenge that young people are very much anticipating that happiness is the great goal of life. It's interesting because when I think of my dad, he's 85, so he was born just at the end of the Great Depression, lived through World War II. Uh, You know, for him and for that generation, unceasing happiness was hardly the goal. And it seems to me that in many respects, they appear a lot more resilient because they've gone through a lot of tough times. Is that the downside here that this fascination with happiness means that we just don't want to go through anything tough. No, that's right. And we're hearing a lot about a lack of resilience and our children being sort of caught at the cotton wool generation where they can't cope with anything. So suddenly you find NCA level one is being scrapped. Um, and that's part of, you know, there's this whole sort of let's keep our kids um, well and happy and okay but we're not training them to be resilient and as you say your father went through a lot my mother was one of seven you know she was walking to school raising her siblings and getting her one pair of clothes new clothes a year and going through some you know she had some hardships and in her life not probably like your father but um I think that they, yeah, they were. They were tougher and they were robust. And I do think that we, um, yeah, we, 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 we do worry if people aren't happy and if they're not bouncing around. And most of us aren't. <laughs> well, in that regard, of course, happiness is not always appropriate. Uh, you know, like if good things happen, if you win the lotto, you're going to be happy. But if your cat dies, you're probably going to be sad. And being sad would be perfectly normal. It seems to me that our fascination with happiness has also kind of pathologized negative feelings. Like whenever a negative feeling appears, it's like a sniffle that proves you've got a cold and you, you need to take medication. I mean, negative feelings aren't that big of a problem, are they? No, they're not. I mean, as a teenager, I had my ups and downs and I wrote a diary and some days I marked it t- two out of ten. And my mother would call me a sensitive, her sensitive warrior. Now today, if I went to if my daughter who's 16 came to me with that, I'd probably march her off to a psychologist and, and they would probably diagnose her with anxiety and so on and so on. So I think you're exactly right. You're right. Well, you've talked, though, that there is an industry that wants to sort of convince us, a bit like the weight loss industry, that losing weight would be relatively easy. Does the industry have any great tips on how we can be happy? I don't know. I mean, I think there's there are some tips. But also, I mean, there's, what I find really interesting is the rise of the life coach as well. If you're not um, sure what you're doing, if you're bumbling around, if you're not flourishing, go and see a life coach, pay $200 an hour or whatever um, to get some advice and guidance and the very sort of things that often you can work out yourself. Yeah, so I think, and then, I mean, I, I totally respect the role of psychotherapists and, and psychologists and counsellors and they have they have an important role. But um, yeah, I think, I think that there are some things that we just couldn't, can work out ourselves. And it's, I mean, for me, I was actually thinking that this, as I was coming to meet you, I love running and that's my happy drug. So most days I'll go for a jog and um, and it's not that I want to achieve any great running goals, but that's something that makes me happy and being around my friends makes me happy. So I guess, you know, for most of us, we can work out what those things are. Um, but yeah, there will be days where you just wake up and feel a bit blah. And particularly at the moment, we live in a very you know, unprecedented time with the pandemic. Poor Aucklanders and um, people in Waikato have been locked down and you hardly, if you are feeling great, then that's wonderful, but a lot um, lot of us aren't. 
Well, exactly. And I, I do wonder if the fact that this whole COVID experience has brought out some real ugliness in Kiwis. We've we've not talked to each other very nicely. We've had some real heat happen that many of us didn't realise was sort of under the surface. And I wonder if it's because when the scenario, like a pandemic, makes happiness really quite elusive, a lot of us have felt quite lost. We have, we have, exactly. And you're right, we're becoming quite a divided nation. I just um, wrote a story last week about some of the unvaxxed um, people are losing, losing their jobs this week. The other one that's risen is, you know, which we've heard Jacinda talk about a lot, is the need to be kind and kindness. And I think it's all these buzzwords. And I, I was just interested in, in the term happiness and how that whole industry that's driven but there's you know you could apply it to a lot of labels there's a lot a lot of labeling going on in our society at the moment Well, that's an interesting point about language because it is kind of like every positive feeling is being forced into this happiness funnel. It has to sort of come out as happiness. But actually, there are lots of really positive feelings. There's contentment and satisfaction. There's meaning and purpose. There's lots of really good feelings, but they're not necessarily as joyful or ecstatic as happiness. Is it a problem that we have to dial up every other good feeling until it hits the happiness level? Yeah, I think it is actually. I think you're right that we should, yeah, the sense of we should be living, um, having a purpose and being kind and everything is labelled. And yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you can apply that to all sorts of things. A lot of um, mental health conditions or kids are suddenly dyslexic and um, a lot of them are. Or your child, you know, your child doesn't read well. They, we put We label so much. And I think that has been, as a society, we're labelling, over-labelling, I would say, rather than we probably just need to ease up on it. Well, what is the answer, though, going forward, given that we agree that unceasing happiness is probably setting the bar so high that actually, instead of creating happiness, we're creating disappointment because we're expecting happiness, but life doesn't deliver enough of it. And so we feel extra disappointed. What is the answer? Yeah. I actually think it's just being, it's probably being aware and just being aware that we are in this climate where happiness has become an industry along with, you know, about, as I said, about the positive psychology movement. I wrote in my column about um, an author who was diagnosed with cancer and she was told, oh, you know, if she was cheery and positive, she, that would help her overcome it. But actually, you're, if you are feeling, you know, if, you're, if your life is threatened, then you'll be sad and, of course, you'll feel all these other emotions. So I think it's just being aware of it, not being sucked into it. I don't think the industry is going to necessarily go away, um, the positive psychology movement. It's not. But it is definitely a trend. And there's this wonderful clinical psychologist in Auckland at Auckland University, Kerry Gibson, and she has started talking about this and saying, actually, we need to stop over labeling and stop being putting everything into boxes so much and accepting there's a big gray area between black and white between happiness and unhappiness between um depression anxiety and uh, you know healthy state um so i think that that maybe within that community by starting to challenge it and that that could change things as well Yeah, I mean, these things can come in trends. They can be cyclical. We've started today by talking about the kids and the fact that they're set up for believing that they should be happy. When you speak to other parents now who you know who so often have said things like I just want my kids to be happy which on the surface is a perfectly normal thing to say what should we be saying to our kids now to help prepare them for for actual real life rather than setting them up for disappointment I think we should be saying you know you're going to have your ups and downs you're going to have your hard times not sort of jump when they're too if they're up and down, I mean, you know, hormones can come into it when they're teens, um, issues going on at school. But I know that there is a concern among some parents when their kids start over talk. Well, they, you want your kids to share, but then when they start saying things like, oh, I feel suicidal or something like that, and I've heard of cases that happen. So it's that balance between teaching your kids to be resilient learning you know making sure that you're there to listen and talk to them but actually that we are going to have our hard times and it's perfectly normal being part of the, being 
being a human being, it's normal to experience a range of emotions and that you just have to, you know, every every up comes with a down and or not a down, but you know, you're not always going to feel up all the time. Some people are lucky. I mean, of my three daughters, I've got one that who is very happy and very content and she's sort of was born sunny with a sunny disposition um and yeah so i think some people are really naturally lucky that they just are born that way and so um i would just think being there to listen but also teaching our kids to that life is has its ups and downs we have many chapters in our lives and some of those chapters you know often you do have to go through hard times to experience personal growth and so it's not um yeah, it does make you grow as a person and it's teaching our children to be deal with that and they will be stronger through it and but then being there for them they are having really difficult times sarah makes some interesting points there and at the end i think it's aristotle's point actually that growth is happiness that one of the problems here is that comfort and happiness is a comfortable feeling uh, is really the enemy of growth and progress in our lives that the reason that we make positive change as individuals and in society is actually pain it isn't comfort that leads to change at all comfort means you know what don't spoil anything i want things to be just so problem is you might wake up a year later, 10 years later, a lifetime later, and realize you never got round to those goals. So on the one hand, there's this problem that the pursuit of happiness might prevent our growth. But on the other, it's perfectly acceptable, isn't it, to want to be happy. Nothing too unusual about that. But it's not the life coach. It's not the self-help books. It's not medication that has the key to happiness. Where is it really to be found? Well, an incredible study out of Harvard University might have some of the answers. This longitudinal study has been going for over 75 years. It's incredible. And it's tracked two groups of Bostonian men, one who went to Harvard and the other who were from the wrong side of the tracks. And they've interviewed these men and now their families every two years, done health checks on them, brain scans, checkups, interviewed them had them do a questionnaire to find out over a lifetime what really does contribute to well-being, to happiness, to a healthy life. And the answers, well, they weren't really that surprising. Well, the lessons aren't about wealth or fame or working harder and harder. The clearest message that we get from this 75-year study is this. Good relationships keep us happier and healthier, period. We've learned three big lessons about relationships. The first is that social connections are really good for us and that loneliness kills. It turns out that people who are more socially connected to family, to friends, to community, are happier, they're physically healthier, and they live longer than people who are less well-connected. And the experience of loneliness turns out to be toxic. People who are more isolated than they want to be from others find that they are less happy, their health declines earlier in midlife, their brain functioning declines sooner, and they live shorter lives than people who are not lonely. And the sad fact is that at any given time, more than one in five Americans will report that they're lonely. And we know that you can be lonely in a crowd and you can be lonely in a marriage. So the second big lesson that we learned is that it's not just the number of friends you have and it's not whether or not you're in a committed relationship, but it's the quality of your close relationships that matters. It turns out that living in the midst of conflict is really bad for our health. High conflict marriages, for example, without much affection, turn out to be very bad for our health, perhaps worse than getting divorced. And living in the midst of good, warm relationships is protective. Once we had followed our men all the way into their 80s, we wanted to look back at them at midlife and to see if we could predict who was going to grow into a happy, healthy octogenarian and who wasn't. And when we gathered together everything we knew about them at age 50, it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. 
It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50 were the healthiest at age 80. And good, close relationships seem to buffer us from some of the slings and arrows of getting old. Our most happily partnered men and women reported in their 80s that on the days when they had more physical pain, their moods stayed just as happy. But the people who were in unhappy relationships, on the days when they reported more physical pain, it was magnified by more emotional pain. And the third big lesson that we learn about relationships and our health is that good relationships don't just protect our bodies, they protect our brains. It turns out that being in a securely attached relationship to another person in your 80s is protective, that the people who are in relationships where they really feel they can count on the other person in times of need, those people's memories stay sharper longer. And the people in relationships where they feel they really can't count on the other one, those are the people who experience earlier memory decline. And those good relationships, they don't have to be smooth all the time. Some of our octogenarian couples could bicker with each other day in and day out. But as long as they felt that they could really count on the other when the going got tough, those arguments didn't take a toll on their memories. So, this message that good, close relationships are good for our health and well-being. This is wisdom that's as old as the hills. Why is this so hard to get and so easy to ignore? Well, we're human. What we'd really like is a quick fix, something we can get that'll make our lives good and keep them that way. Relationships are messy and they're complicated, and the the hard work of tending to family and friends, that's not sexy or glamorous. It's also lifelong. It never ends. The people in our 75-year study who were the happiest in retirement were the people who had actively worked to replace workmates with new playmates. Just like the millennials in that recent survey, many of our men, when they were starting out as young adults, really believed that fame and wealth and high achievement were what they needed to go after to have a good life. But over and over, over these 75 years, our study has shown that the people who fared the best were the people who leaned into relationships with family, with friends, with community. So isn't that ironic? The individual pursuit of happiness is best found in community. It's actually in relationships that we find the most ongoing sense of well-being and happiness. And of course, that resilience to be able to navigate difficult times together. We should be very concerned about this cult of happiness because I do think it's setting us all up for a bit of disappointment. We see evidence of this, of course, in the way that we curate our lives on social media. You know, we show the happy pictures of the holiday, but we, we don't show the sad pictures by and large. We don't express the negative feelings. And of course, in more recent times, when we have, that has often led to some kind of conflict and disagreement. It's just a reminder that we need real relationships and we need them over long periods of time. And what we need to do as a community is get offline and back in person with real people. And we need to learn and teach our young people how to cultivate, mend, repair, grow, develop meaningful relationships. I keep wondering in our school curriculum whether we're going to add that fourth R, you know, reading, writing, arithmetic and relationships. That would be a great class for every teenager to have to attend. Love to hear your thoughts on this. Visit the website activeintelligence.nz and subscribe to the episodes and we'll deliver them straight to your inbox. We'll see you next time on Active Intelligence.